Well, good morning. I give you a warm welcome to our online service as we gather as Viewfield Baptist Church. We're family and we love God, we love one another, and we love our community. We want to be a people of love, a people of grace, a people of, of mercy, a people who are walking by the Spirit of God. So I give you a warm welcome. Thank you so much for connecting this morning. Our desire is that we might meet with God, that God might speak into our lives, that he might touch our lives afresh, that he might bring hope to those who are feeling hopeless, that he might bring peace to those who are anxious and worried, that he might bring joy to those who are, who are downcast. Uh, we just pray that God will work, that God will minister uh, this morning as we gather. Please download a copy of the bulletin from the website or go onto our social media pages and you'll find out what's going on in the life of the church. If you're new to the church, we'd be delighted to chat with you and to tell you more about the life of the church. We know there are a number of people who've inquired about membership and baptism. If you're interested in, in membership and baptism, please get in touch with uh, the office. And we have a church members meeting coming up at the end of January. Um, people who attend the church are not members are also invited to that meeting, but obviously um, you cannot vote. But um, please be prayerful for us as we prepare for that meeting. Uh, be prayerful <coughs> about the church and about what God's doing and, and his leading for us as his people. And... Uh, Continue to encourage one another. There's lots going on. If you want to find out more, as I said, please check out the website or the social media uh, pages. But I want to read um, God's Word just now and then pray and then we're going to sing together. I want to read just some words from Psalm 30. I will exalt you, O Lord, for you lifted me out of the depths. And did not let my enemies gloat over me. O Lord my God, I called to you for help, and you healed me. O Lord, you brought me up from the grave. You spared me from going down into the pit. Sing to the Lord, you saints of his. Praise his holy name, for his anger lasts only a moment. But his favour lasts a lifetime. Weeping may remain for a night, but rejoicing <coughs> comes in the morning. When I felt secure, I said, I shall never be shaken. O Lord, when you favoured me, you made my mountain stand firm. But when you hid your face, I was dismayed. To you, O Lord, I called. To the Lord, I cried for mercy. What gain is there in my destruction, in my going down into the pit? Will the dust praise you? Will it proclaim your faithfulness? Hear, O Lord, and be merciful to me. O Lord, be my help. You turn my wailing into dancing. You remove my sackcloth and clothe me with joy, that my heart may sing to you and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give you thanks forever. Let's pray. God, I just thank you that you're with us right now. You're a God full of compassion, full of love, full of grace. Thank you that you um, want to bless us, that you want to pour out your favour upon us that your mercies are new every morning, that your grace is enough. And God, we desire today to meet with you, to hear from you, to encounter you. So God, come. Come by your Holy Spirit. Come and move. Come and speak. Come and bless. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's join together in worship of our great God.
your presence all our fears are washed away when we see you we find strength Good morning everyone. We're going to start this morning with a short quiz and the quiz is called Who's in Charge? I'm going to show you some pictures of groups of people and I'd like you to work out who is in charge of each of these groups of people or situations. I'm going to give you two clues for each one. The first clue will be the answer with the letters jumbled up and the second clue will be a picture. So if you're watching along with other people, you might like to try and see which of you can give the right answer first. So here's the first one. It's a school playground and the question is, who is in charge of the school, the pupils and the staff? Here's the letters jumbled up. Here's a picture. And of course, the correct answer is the head teacher is in charge of the school. Here's the second one. Who's in charge of all the players on the pitch for a football match? Here's the letters jumbled up. And a picture. And of course, the answer is the referee is in charge of the match. Here's the next one and the question is who's in charge of an orchestra? Perhaps when they're rehearsing and when they're performing, who makes decisions like how fast they're going to play and how loud they're going to play to make the music sound good? So here's the letters jumbled up. Here's a picture. And of course the correct answer is the conductor is in charge of the orchestra. And the last one for just now, imagine you're on a big aeroplane, you're going on holiday somewhere and uh, of all the people who are actually on the aeroplane, who is the person in charge? So here's the letters jumbled up. Here's a picture. And of course, the answer is that the captain is in charge of the aeroplane. There are lots of situations in our lives where there is somebody who's in charge. And if things are working properly, then the person who gets chosen to be in charge gets chosen because they've got lots of experience, maybe lots of training, uh, people who are wise, who make good decisions, and especially important, people who want to do what's best for the people that they are in charge of. And if you're in one of these situations and you're not in charge, then you might still get some choices, but ultimately it's the person in charge who can make the final decision. So, for example, if you are at school and um, when you go out to play at break times, I'm sure usually you're allowed to choose who you want to play with. You're probably allowed to choose what you want to play at. But it may well be the head teacher who decides where you're allowed to play, particularly at the moment where a lot of schools have got their playgrounds divided up so that different classes play in different areas. And if we don't do what the person in charge says, if we break the rules or we don't respect the person in charge or um, we do the wrong thing, then 
things won't really work out well for us. We might find that we get punished. We might find just that things go badly um, and things uh, can happen that aren't really for our best. Perhaps if you're playing a football match and you don't respect the referee, you might find yourself being sent off. And so it's important that we respect the people who are in charge. But here's another question for you. Who is in charge of the world? Now, if you were to go down Dunfermline High Street and ask people that question, I imagine you might get quite a lot of different answers. But for us as Christians, we believe that God is in charge of the world. And the Bible has lots of different names for God. And there's a couple of them that help us to understand that God is in charge. And one of these is that he is sovereign. And basically, when the Bible tells us that God is sovereign, that means much the same thing as that God is king. And in fact, the Bible tells us that God isn't just king. He is, in fact, the king of all kings. That means he's in charge of the whole world, including all the people who are in charge of some of these smaller things that we already looked at. So I've got another question for you to think about. And this one is one really more to think a little bit about rather than something you might just know. And there are probably quite a lot of good answers to this question. So the question is, what is the difference between God and all of these other people who are in charge of smaller things? You might like, if you're with other people in your household, you might like to discuss that question and see what answers you come up with. Um, or if you're on your own, or even if you're not on your own, you might like to write your answer in the comments. So what do you think is the difference between God and these people who are in charge of things? I'm going to give you a moment to think about that. So, as I said, there are probably quite a few good answers to that question. I thought of two and I'm going to share those with you now. The first thing I thought of is that most people are just in charge of one thing or maybe two or three things. But for example, the head teacher is in charge of her school or maybe she's in charge of two schools. But when she goes on the aeroplane to go on holiday, she's certainly not in charge of the aeroplane. And so most of these people are just in charge of one thing or just a few things. But God is in charge of absolutely everything. And so that's a huge difference between God and all of these people. And the second thing I thought of is that God is perfect, but people are not perfect. So all of these people who are in charge of things like schools and orchestras and football matches and aeroplanes and many other things, even if they're very good at their job, even if they've trained lots and lots, even if they're very experienced, even if they want the very best for the people that they are responsible for, they might sometimes make mistakes. They might not always know what is the very best thing to do. They might sometimes disagree with someone else that they're working alongside because people are not perfect. They can try their very best, but they might not always get everything right. But God is perfect and God always gets everything right. God understands every situation. He knows everything that's going on in the world. He understands each of his people and every instruction that he gives and every situation that he directs people in he will always do what is best for people and we can trust him completely to always get it right. So I'm going to leave you with one last question to think about. If God is in charge of everything how does that affect our behaviour and our attitudes? Wonderful God, wonderful God, you are my shield, my protector. I can lie down, go to sleep, knowing you're watching over me. Wonderful God, wonderful God, help me to trust you forever. I need not fear, cause you are here. I'm
Well, let's continue to worship God as we join together in prayer. Let's pray together. Lord God, I just thank you uh, for your presence with us today. Uh, we cry out to you. We pray knowing that you incline an ear towards us, knowing that we're told in James 5 or 16 that the earnest prayers of a righteous person have great power and produce wonderful results. God, we need you. Every hour we need you. We need your help. We need your leading. We need your provision, God, in so many areas of our life, God, in, in every aspect of our life, God, we need you. We're so dependent upon you and afresh we affirm our trust and our faith and our confidence in you. We want to be a people of faith and not fear. You want to choose faith, choose to depend on God, choose to rely on God. Uh, as we're told in Matthew's Gospel, that we're to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added unto you. We're not to worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow has enough worries of its own. Help us to live in the present and to live a life step by step of trusting God, of being fully reliant on God. God, just help us even now as we come to hear your word. Help us to discern what you're saying. Help us to, to listen, to be humble of heart. And God, may you touch our hearts even afresh this morning. And God, we want to pray today for those who are unwell. We, Lord, we ask that you would touch them with your healing hand. According to your will and purpose, bring complete healing into situations. Uh, Lord, and if the complete healing is not your will, Lord, give people the grace to cope with whatever they are facing. We know that your grace is sufficient for us. And Lord, we need that grace. Again, we need that help. Lord, for those who are mourning, Lord, comfort them. Be close to them. Lord, may they know that peace that passeth all understanding. And God, we continue to pray for our church family, Lord, fully. We just thank you for our family. Keep us united. Protect us. Lord, lead us and guide us. Help us to clearly know what you are saying. And help us to be courageous to follow your will and your leading and your guidance. God, we pray for the church leadership that you would protect them, that you would bless them, you would give them wisdom. We pray for the up and coming church meeting, God, that that, that would go well and be an encouragement and that it would be a sense of your presence right at the heart. Lord, we pray for people who are new to the church, to help them to get integrated, to, to feel, far, feel part of the family, to be able to use their gifts um, and Lord multiply what we're doing I pray God that we would have a greater impact on Dunfermline and the surrounding areas may each one of us take our responsibility to be his witnesses uh, Lord I pray for hope explored as well as we think about that that you would bless that course bless those who'll attend and Lord may uh, there be a real move of your spirit may people trust in Christ and find hope in a hopeless world he is our only hope we thank you for the hope that we have in Christ. We are a people of hope. And God, I, I just pray now as we turn to your word that you would speak, that God, we would meet with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I want to read again words from Nehemiah chapter 4. When Sambalat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews and in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, What are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble burned as they are? Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, What they are building, if even a fox climbed up in it, he would break down their wall of stones. Hear us, O our God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. So we rebuilt the wall till all 
of it reached half its height, for the people worked with all their heart. But when Sambalat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the men of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's walls had gone ahead, and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, The strength of the laborers is giving out, and there is much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Also, our enemies said, Before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them, and will kill them and put an end to the work. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over, Wherever you turn, they will attack us. Therefore I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall, at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears and bows. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials and the rest of the people, Don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome. And fight for your brothers, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. When our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to his own work. From that day on, half of my men did the work, while the other half were equipped with spears, shields, bows and armour. The officers posted themselves behind all the people of Judah who were building the wall. Those who carried materials did their work with one hand and held a weapon in the other. And each of the builders wore his sword at his side as he worked. But the man who sounded the trumpet stayed with me. Then I said to the nobles, the officials and the rest of the people, The work is extensive and spread out, and we are widely separated from each other along the wall. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there. Our God will fight for us. So we continued the work with half the men holding spears from the first light of dawn till the stars came out. At that time I also said to the people, Have every man and his helper stay inside Jerusalem at night, so that they can serve us as guards by night and workmen by day. Neither I, nor my brothers, nor my men, nor the guards with me took off our clothes. Each had his weapon, even when he went for water. May God bless the reading and reflection upon his word this morning. Recently I watched a program on the Animal Channel that showed (coughs) a herd of buffalo defending themselves from an attack from six lions. It was fascinating to watch how the strategy of the buffaloes was to remain together in the herd and in unity, to work together, to protect each other. The lions were clearly plotting to have buffalo for dinner, but eventually they found one buffalo. This buffalo had strayed from the herd maybe a a couple of hundred yards and they went after that buffalo. The buffalo had wandered off by itself and was easy pickings for the lions. There's a lesson for us there. As the church, we have to remember that we are in a spiritual battle. Satan is a clear and present enemy. The Bible describes him as a devouring lion. We're told in 1 Peter 5 verse 8, Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. We need to stick together as the people of God. We need to do life together. We need to to work in unity. We need one another. Satan wants to bring division. He wants to separate people from the herd. He makes them mad at the church and Christians angry because of some other reason and once they're away from the herd he intensifies his attack some people laugh nowadays oh come on the devil that's rubbish a wee red man with a a pitchfork well I don't believe the devil is like that but he is real and he is the source of all evil and the bible clearly says that the devil is real So who is he? Well, he's a fallen angel, we're told in Isaiah 14 and Luke 10, verses 17 to 20. He's a personal, spiritual being who is in active rebellion 
against God. If you've got a Bible, turn to, to Ephesians chapter 6. And I want to read verses 11 to 12. We're told there, Put on the full armour of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. What powerful words. We're in a spiritual battle. We're told as well in 1 Peter 5 verse 8 that he is a devouring lion. We're told in 2 Corinthians 11 verse 3 that he's a deceiving serpent. We're also told in scripture that he's an angel of light. So what are his tactics? Well he aims to destroy. We're told in John 10 verse 10 that the thief comes to kill and destroy but Jesus came to give life and life in all its fullness. So the devil wants to destroy Christians and to destroy churches. He wants to blind people from the truth we're told in 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4. He wants to tempt. He wants to sow doubts into people's minds. Charles Baudelaire once said that the devil's finest trick is to persuade you that he does not exist. He is a real person. He is a clear and present enemy. And he wants to destroy. He wants to pull down. So we need to be on our guard and we need to put on the full armour of God. You know, as the people of God start building, we will soon be battling. We need to be prepared. We do have a real enemy. The Christian's battle is not against flesh and blood, but against Satan and his demonic forces. However, often they use flesh and blood to oppose the Lord's work. However, we need to be encouraged that Christ has destroyed the power of sin and Satan and consequently we fight from victory and not for victory. The result is not in doubt because of Christ's death and resurrection and it will be finalised when Christ comes again. We need to tell the devil and his demons who we are in Christ. We are children of God. We are raised up and seated with Christ in heavenly places. Christ is our Lord and Saviour and all authority in heaven and on earth was given to him and we serve in his name. So as the scripture says in James 4 verse 7, we need to submit ourselves then to God to resist the devil and he will, he will flee from us. But when there is building and blessing, get ready for opposition because the enemy doesn't want to see the work of the Lord make progress. In Nehemiah, as long as the people in Jerusalem were content with their sad lot, the enemy left them alone. But when the Jews began to serve the Lord and bring glory to God's name, the enemy became active. Chapter 4 describes at least four tactics that the enemy used to try to stop the work on the walls. Last week we looked at the fact that the enemy used ridicule and plots of war. And this pressure from outside led to discouragement. Chapter 4 verse 10 and fear. Chapter, sorry, yeah, chapter 4 verse 10 and fear. Chapter 4 verses 11 to 23. But none of those tactics worked either. Nehemiah was steadfast and unmovable and led his people to finish the work in 52 days. So I want to consider this morning discouragement and fear. These are are two of the enemy's tactics to try and sow discouragement into the believer, into the people of God, to try and paralyze the people of God in fear. So let's see what God wants to say to us as we can consider these two thoughts this morning. First of all, discouragement, the enemy's tactic of discouragement. We see this clearly in verse 10. Often pressures from without create pressures 
within. It isn't easy to carry on your work when you're surrounded by danger and daily face the demands of a task that seems impossible. If the Jews became discouraged, they would defeat themselves and Sanballat and his allies would never have to wage war. Discouragement is a key weapon in Satan's arsenal. He wants the people of God to feel impotent, powerless, dispirited, downhearted, dejected. There's an old legend that says that once the devil advertised his tools for sale at public auction. When the prospective buyers assembled, there was one oddly shaped tool which was labelled not for sale. Asked to explain why this was, the devil answered, I can spare my other tools, but I cannot spare this one. It is the most useful implement that I have. It's called discouragement, and with it I can work my way into hearts otherwise inaccessible. When I get this tool into a person's heart, the way is open to plant anything there I may desire. The legend embodies sober truth. Discouragement is a dangerous state of mind because it leaves one open to the assault of the enemies of the soul. You know, it was discouragement that kept Israel from entering the promised land at Kadesh Barnea, as we're told in Numbers 13, verse 31. We can't attack these people, for they are stronger than we are. Then we're told in Numbers 32, verse 9, that the ten unbelieving spies discouraged the heart of the children of Israel. Unbelief, leading to discouragement. And consequently, as a result, the nation wandered in the wilderness for 40 years until the new generation was ready to conquer the land. See, the Jewish workers here in Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 10, were discouraged. The ridicule and the plots of war were wearing them down. And they were feeling that they were no longer able to complete the work. Look at verse 10. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, The strength of the laborers is giving out. There is so much rubble. We cannot do this. We cannot rebuild the wall. You know, maybe you're feeling a bit like that today in your Christian life. Maybe you're feeling that about the church, not just locally, but maybe globally you're thinking, we cannot do this. Maybe you feel defeated. We cannot rebuild, even out of this pandemic. Everything's doom and gloom. That you're discouraged. Well, first of all, seek God, trust in God, cry out to God, put your faith in God. And as you rely on him, submit to him, resist the devil, he will flee from you. Discouragement is so dangerous, it paralyzes people and it paralyzes the people of God. We cannot rebuild the wall, that's what they're saying so discouraged the task ahead of them was so great and they were so discouraged we're not able the problem was that they had taken their eyes off the Lord they'd started looking at themselves and their problems and the discouraged Jewish workers were actually agreeing with the enemy who said already that they were feeble agreeing with the enemy they had lost their confidence in God Nehemiah had already declared that the God of heaven would give them success. We're told already that God would fight for them. However, the people failed to see it at this point. They were problem focused rather than God focused. What about you? Maybe at this point in time you are discouraged. Maybe you're tired, you're weary, you're downhearted. Maybe the task ahead of you in your Christian life or even as you consider this local church seems so great. Well, I want to say to you, stop looking at your problems and look at your God. Look at your God. The God of the impossible. The God who can do all things. Our God is able, more than able. Look up and look at God. Remember this. 
the task ahead of you is never as great as the power within you. Nehemiah didn't pay much attention to these complainers and went right on with the work. He didn't let himself get sidetracked by these complaints and he didn't get discouraged himself. Nehemiah got encouragement from prayer and from the promises of God and the occasional complaints of some of the people didn't upset him. And as a people of God, we need to be more like Nehemiah. We need to have a greater faith in God. We have to have a trust and a dependence upon God. Satan wants to discourage us. He wants us to feel defeated and deflated and dejected. But friends, we fight from victory. Our God is able, more than able. But secondly, we see here the tactic of of fear. You know, the Jews who lived in the outlying villages kept bringing a report to the city that the enemy was planning another surprise attack. In verse 12, we're told that the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. Ten times is a Hebrew term, meaning many times. They're coming under potential attack over and over again. And understandably, the people were afraid. Don't miss it here in the text. They were terrified. They were paralyzed with fear. You know, in his first inaugural address on March the 4th, 1933, President Franklin D. Roosevelt said to a nation in the grip of an economic depression, The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Why? Well, because fear paralyzes you. And fear is contagious and it paralyzes others. Fear and faith cannot live in the same heart. Jesus said in Matthew 8 verse 26, Why are you so afraid, O you of little faith? And I think in these days, particularly in these days where we face a pandemic, my concern for Christians is at the moment some are living paralyzed by fear and not trusting in God, not depending on God. And they're missing out on the peace, that peace that passeth all understanding. We're not to live our lives in fear, to live our lives trusting in God. Nehemiah wasn't afraid of the enemy. But when he saw that his people were starting to become afraid, he began to act. What did he do? Well, Nehemiah's first step was to post guards at the most conspicuous and vulnerable places on the wall. Look at verse 13. Therefore I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears and bows. Then Nehemiah encouraged the people not to be afraid, but to look to the Lord for help. Verse 14. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives and your homes. Clearly, we need to be wise. We need to be on the front foot. We need to stand in faith and we need to have strategies for the fight for the things that we are facing in our life with godly wisdom which God will give when we ask for it but we're not to be afraid we need to remember the Lord who is great and awesome and we need to stand together and encourage one another in unity fighting for one another and with one another. If we fear the Lord, we need not fear the enemy. Nehemiah's heart was captivated by the great and awesome God, and he knew that God was strong enough to meet the challenge. Friends, when we face a situation that creates fear in our hearts, we must remind ourselves of our God who is great, 
and awesome. Our lives are in his hands. Don't look at the problem. Look at your God. Think about what God said to Joshua when he was called. In Joshua 1 verse 9. Have I not told you this? Have I not told you this? Be strong and courageous. Do not be discouraged. Do not be terrified. For the Lord your God is with you. Wherever you go. He'll fight your battles. He'll give you the ground. Trust in him. When the enemy learned that Jerusalem was armed and ready, they backed off. Look at verse 15. When our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to his own work. God had frustrated their plot. We need to be reminded that the battle belongs to our God, that he is in control. Be encouraged that the will of God comes from the heart of God and therefore we need not be afraid. Nehemiah knew that he couldn't interrupt the work every time he heard a new rumour. So he set up a defensive plan to solve the problem. Half of the men worked on the wall while the other half stood guard. He saw to it that the people carrying materials carried weapons and that the workers carried Swords. The man with the trumpet was to stay close to Nehemiah so that the alarm could be given immediately. The people were prepared to fight. They would build, but they would also battle. But they were being reminded by Nehemiah that it was God who fought with them and it was God who would give them the victory. Look at verses 19 to 20. And I said to the nobles, the officials and the rest of the people, The work is extensive and spread out and we are widely separated from each other along the wall. Wherever you hear the sound of the trumpet, join us there. Our God will fight for us. Our God will fight for us. They got on with the work. May we do this also. Just get on with the work of of building, trusting that the, the God of heaven will give us success. May we expand our borders and boundaries as God works through us. May God do that work through us as his power works within us. May we be on our guard against discouragement and fear. Let's not give the enemy a foothold. Let's look to God and remember that God fights for us. Friends, no matter what the workers were doing or where they laboured on the wall, they all kept an ear open for the sound of the trumpet. What an example for us to follow as we await the return of the Lord. To have an ear open for the trumpet. If you've got a Bible, turn to 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians and verses 4 to 16. I just want to read just a verse from there. Just as we finish. We're told there. For the Lord himself will come down from heaven. With a loud command. With the voice of the archangel. And with the trumpet call of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. He is coming again. Friends until he comes. Until we hear that trumpet sound. May we work and build. For the kingdom of God. May we give our all. Looking to God. Trusting in God. That he'll fight for us. That that God will, will lead us. And guide us. And provide for us. May we stand together in unity. And protect us God. Is our desire. From discouragement. From fear. Our response. To attacks. To opposition. To the enemy is to have faith in a God who is great and awesome. Friends, let's pray. God, I just thank you for your word, for the challenge of your word, for the truth of your word. And Lord, I just pray by your Holy Spirit, you would take this message, you would implant it deep into our hearts, that God, that you would fill us to overflowing with your spirit and that we would be released from any discouragement or fear 
and that we would walk in faith and victory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to respond to God's word by singing together to lead us to our time of communion. to this table we come with holy awe we come in reverence before an awesome God a God who is the author of salvation um, a God through sending his precious and loved son into the world has made a way for us to be forgiven of our sin and to enter into a relationship with him um, through the coming the death the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We can become children of God through our faith in Christ. We are 
children of God. We're justified, we're reconciled to the Father. And truly we remember and give thanks as we eat bread and drink the cup. We remember that God fights for us. That God made a way where there seemed to be no way. And as we think about that first Easter, as we consider our own situations just now, we are aware that God still is fighting for us. That God can still make a way where there seems to be no way. That we are on the victory side. Our hope is in Christ alone. He is our hope for this life and for the next. The best is always yet to come for the Christian. Let me just read some well-known words from Isaiah chapter 53 that, that speak many years before of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Who has believed our message and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to uh, attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering, like one from whom men hide their faces. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us turned to his own way and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked, and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days. And the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great and he will divide the spoils with the strong because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors for he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors let's pray together Lord God I just thank you for our precious Lord I thank you for his obedience to the will of the Father that the word was made flesh and dwelt among us and that flesh was torn apart on the cross he, he set his face Though for the way of the cross he humbled himself and was obedient even unto death on that cross despite all the suffering despite all the torment all the abuse all the accusations despite the forsakenness from his father in those hours of darkness he was willing yet not my will but your will be done he cried out And even on that cross, he cried out, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And he, he took it all for us. The wrath of God that we deserved was poured out upon him. The perfect Lamb of God, the only one able to pay the sacrifice because he was sinless. He was slain for my sin, for your sin. So that we the guilty ones could go free. What a God. What a love. What kind of love is this? So God today as we eat bread and drink the cup. We remember and give thanks for the body given for us. For the blood shed for us. For without the shedding of blood there would be no forgiveness of sins. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. Amen. On the night you would be betrayed, the Lord Jesus Christ took a loaf of bread and he broke it and he said, This is my body given for you. Whenever you eat this, do so 
in remembrance of me. Let's eat the bread now and remember the body of Christ given for you. In the same way after supper the Lord Jesus took the cup and he said this cup is the new covenant sealed by my blood. Whenever you drink this do so in remembrance of me. Let's drink together. It's a sign of our unity in Christ. The blood of Christ shed for you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, your death we remember. Your resurrection we confess. Your final coming we await. All the praise and the glory be unto you forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for connecting today. And if you have any inquiries or you would like to receive a visit or um, yeah, just like to catch up with somebody, don't hesitate to contact the office. We'd be delighted to, to be in touch uh, with you. Um, you're not journeying alone. We're standing together and we're standing in faith and victory. Have a great Sunday. We'll connect again soon.